Hello and welcome to Social Church. We've got a brilliant question today and I'm really excited to have our friend back with us, Nathaniel Jensen from Answers in Genesis. Our question today, how are scientific dating methods flawed? To understand the problems with the, the mainstream scientific explanation for how old the Earth is, for how long humans have been on the planet, for how long species have been on the planet, how old the, the Earth and the entire universe are, we really have to think about what a clock actually is and how scientists can go about discovering astronomical, geological, biological clocks in our universe. So everyone really knows what a clock is intuitively. It's just some way to mark the passage of time. But the way we do that is to have some regularly cycling, repeating process to know that time has progressed, essentially. That's what, it, that's what your watch does, although many people don't wear them anymore. That's what a grandfather clock does. That's, a, that's, that's essentially the, the basic principle behind having a clock. And I say that because everyone knows what it is, but it's helpful to make this implied, implicit fact explicit so we can see how this transfers in principle to other fields of science. In the field of geology and astronomy, which is, those are the two Historically, those are the two primary fields by which scientists have tried to investigate the age of the Earth. What they look for are regularly repeating processes. Uh, in astronomy, they might say, well, what's the speed of light? How far away is a distant star? And so then calculate how long would it take for, for light to go from a distant star all the way to the present and, and reach Earth. So their, their regular process is the movement of light at a particular speed, you know, the distance, and so that the movement of light then is, is marking the passage of time in that view. Perhaps a more readily understandable example would be geology. So anyone who's been to a river or a creek, you know, you, at the mouth of it where, it, where it empties into another body of water, you can see silt accumulating, there's erosion that happens. If that's a regular process, you now have the possibility of having a clock. So if you know and you, and you watch a particular river bed and you see that either the, the, the sides of the river are slowly eroding away and you measure it and it's half a centimeter per year or you, you, you go to the, to the mouth of the river and you see it's depositing silt as it empties that er, eroded material into a, a larger body of water, you know, it's accumulating it a millimeter per year in height. Whatever the rate is, so long as you have this regularly repeating process, you have then the makings of a clock. So those those are the principles at play then in astronomy, in, in geology, and in fact you have it now in biology as well too. So DNA gets passed on generation to generation in humans and animals and plants and fungi. Use humans because they're just the most familiar. Mom and dad pass on their DNA to their offspring, but they do not pass it on perfectly. There are mistakes that occur. and that eventually, as a side note, will probably lead to the extinction of the human race because they're happening so quickly. That's at least what the evolutionists are saying. But that could function then as a clock because it happens at a, at, a, at a regular rate. You just look at the number of differences between parents and offspring. You go further back in time. You can begin to reconstruct history and, and time because of this regular process of DNA changing and the letters, the, the identities of the letters. It's like copying a book by hand, but mistyping or even, or, or miswriting it or, or orally taking notes on a computer and you're, you're typing what someone's saying verbatim, but you hit the wrong keys. That's sort of what's happening with DNA. It's, it's being copied incorrectly at a very low level, but a measurable level. And so we have a clock. Anyway, that's, that's the type of principle that, that's in operation in these three fields of science. And those are just a few illustrations. Where do the mainstream scientists get the conclusion that the Earth, the universe, species are millions of years old, billions of years old for the universe? An analogy back to normal clocks is, is again, helpful. Let's say you walked into a room and, and, and you saw that the grandfather clock was showing uh, 10 a.m. How would you know how, how much time has passed? You'd have to have some sort of starting point when the clock started measuring time, and you'd have to have then the knowledge of what the time is in the present. And you need to know how fast the clock is ticking. If you walk into this room and the grandfather clock shows 10 o'clock and you stand there for five minutes and nothing changes, you have a 
totally different problem on your hands, and now you don't know if you can trust the clock. If you, let's say you walk into the room, you stand there for five minutes, and you're measuring the five minutes by the watch on your wrist, and you see that the grandfather clock moves one minute, you know that the rate at which the grandfather clock is measuring time is slower than the rate at which your watch is measuring time, and so at least one of those clocks must be wrong. Anyway, that's the, the sort of discussion scientists have to have when they're looking at astro astronomical clocks, geologic clocks, biological clocks. We're essentially walking into a room, we're walking into our universe at a particular point in time, looking at the rates at which certain things happen, and then we have to decide, well, is the rate I'm seeing today slow? Is it like that slow grandfather clock? Has it stopped entirely? How do I know that the rate I'm seeing today is reflective of the rate at which this process has occurred historically? So you might walk into the, to the room and the grandfather clock uh, is ticking fast. So you, you, you might stop and wait for five minutes according to your watch and you see that the grandfather clock has advanced 30 minutes. And now you, now you know that something again is amiss but in the opposite direction. That's the, the same concern that arises, should arise at least, when we're thinking about astronomy, biology, geology, these sorts of clocks, because we have so little data. The evolutionists are trying to say that what we see today is a good marker of what's happened historically, and they're trying to argue that what we see today has been consistent for millions, if not billions of years. So I, I think of a, a United States example, we have the Grand Canyon, the Colorado River runs through it, it's, uh, it's a Grand Canyon, of course, is very deep, and classically the Grand Canyon was explained by the slow and gradual erosion of the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon over millions of years. It's a very slow process. Now, how do we know that the rate of erosion has been the same? How do we know that the, the clock, the rate of erosion, hasn't been ticking faster, eroding faster, or slower in times past? If the Colorado River used to be a raging rapids, or if, let's say, according to Genesis, there was a global flood, that would dramatically change the rates of erosion and deposition, that sort of thing. Here's what's so problematic with the mainstream methods of, of doing these clocks. Here's the key assumption that sets apart the mainstream methods from everything else, from anything biblical. When they do their science, mainstream geologists, mainstream astronomers, mainstream biologists go into their study, assuming, by and large, that the rates they're measuring in the present, the ticking of the clock in the present, whether it's in the field of astronomy, the field of geology, the field of biology, they're always assuming the rates of ticking have been basically constant. And what I mean is they'll allow for nuances of change, but they reject a priori from the start any possibility of a global flood. They do not even consider that when they're measuring, calibrating the clock. They're walking into this room, they're seeing a grandfather clock ticking, except we don't know it's a grandfather clock, it's just some process that's happening. And they assume from the outset, no flood can ever change this, and the present is the key to the past. So you can see that the huge problems with this, we know that if we'd walked into a room and we saw a grandfather clock ticking and it was doing something weird, we'd, we, we'd be concerned. We'd be even more concerned if we walked into a room and we had no way of knowing whether or not the grandfather clock was ticking slow or fast. Let's say we had no intuitive sense of time, no movement of the sun, any of these sorts of things. All of that would raise great concerns, and those same great concerns should apply equally well to the fields of astronomy, biology, geology, as mainstream scientists currently practice it. Because they're making this gigantic assumption, they're assuming away the possibility of a flood, of any sort of creation event from the outset. And so, of course, they get the idea that, this, that the clocks that we see in the present have been ticking very slowly. That's been the general rule of thumb, the general conclusion from the fields of astronomy, geology, biology. Now, what has changed in the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years has created some fantastic problems for the mainstream community. So first of all, it's a logical problem, where they a priori reject the idea of a global flood. Second problem, and I can refer to my own research on this, I've been working with the DNA clocks, and I've got to have, I'm gonna have some research that's coming out this year, 2019, on the male inherited DNA. I've already published conclusions with female inherited DNA. So the female inherited DNA is mitochondrial, male is the Y chromosome. Uh, that's just the technical terms. The point is I've been looking at clocks in humans and in other species. And what makes this study so remarkable is I have assumed from the outset, sure, we'll measure the rate at which DNA changes in the present, and just for fun, we'll assume it's been constant, like the evolutionists assume, for as long as humans and other species have been in existence. Well, 
when you do that, so I'm, I'm basically giving the evolutionists all the assumptions that they want. When you do that, the conclusion you reach is that humans and other species have originated just 6,000 years ago. Now what are the evolutionists going to do? Their entire edifice of millions of years rests on assuming the present is the key to the past. If you allow the possibility of a global flood in geology, in astronomy, that sort of thing, the clocks dramatically change, totally rewrites the conclusions. But they have insisted, no, we cannot consider these sorts of supernatural events ever. And so millions of years has marched along as the mainstream view. Now we're in the field of biology, and the dogmatically assumed evolutionary assumptions lead to a very unsettling conclusion from an evolutionary perspective, the origin of people, and really, and uh, uh, I should say the origin of people and the species, and really the, the earth in which they inhabit, much more recent than they've concluded for a long time. What are they going to do with this? They've got a, log a second logical problem. How can they explain away these biological data without violating the assumptions that undergird the millions of years paradigm in geology and astronomy? There's a, there's a third problem. The, the first, of course, is, is just the logically a priori rejection of the flood. Secondly is the internal inconsistency of their assumption. If you assume the presence is the key to the past in geology, you get millions of years. If you do the same in biology, you get 6,000 years. What are they going to do with that? And the young earther has no problem with this because we consider all of these hypotheses and uh, go with those that, that make the most sense of the world. That, that really leads me to the third problem with the mainstream dating methods is their last resort for rejecting the flood, the creation account, any of these sorts of things, is they say, well, it's not science. For something to be science, it has to make testable predictions. So a simple example of this would be gravity is a scientific idea because it makes testable predictions. If I grab something with my hand, lift it, and then let go, gravity predicts, let's say it's a rock, that it's going to fall straight to the earth. And I can do that right now. In fact, I've got a rock in my office. I can, I've just picked it up. I'll drop it. It falls to the ground. Gravity is testable. Uh, and, and we can do it again. And from the standpoint of me speaking right now, that event is still future. It makes a testable prediction. That's science. That's how science works. And I agree with the evolutionists. That's what makes science possible. That's how science should operate. Where we disagree is whether or not creation makes testable predictions. So in the research I've been doing on these DNA clocks, this has led me to make testable predictions about the rate at which the DNA clock ticks in other species, in which the rate has yet to be measured. So the evolutionist last resort to dismiss any counter explanations, that, that resistance being based on the claim that creation doesn't make testable predictions, that is factually in error. They've relied on this for over 40 years to dismiss creation. It's written into U.S. law, and it wouldn't surprise me if it's in British law as well. The idea that creation is not science, therefore it has no place in this discussion, that is, that is factually an error. And so there are abundant scientific reasons to reject the mainstream conclusion of millions of years. It's not this gigantic Goliath that somehow people need to be intimidated by. Nor is the fact that the vast majority of scientists agree with it. Does that, does that hold any water? And the way to see the problem with that idea is you just go backwards in time. When Darwin wrote on the origin of species, he challenged the overwhelming majority of scientists in his day, and he said so in his book. So if the majority determines truth, then we can reject evolution right now because it was not the majority when Darwin first proposed it. He challenged the consensus and changed it. And so I'm just following, creationists are just following Darwin's precedent by challenging the consensus because there's good historical reasons, recent historical events that show the consensus can be totally wrong or I should say the consensus can be totally changed by someone making a strong argument against it. Oh, wow. Thank you, Nathaniel. That was so helpful. If you have a question that you would like us to answer in a later episode, you have a perfect opportunity. We have a form set up on our website, www.wearesocialchurch.com. Just fill in the form, and then hopefully we'll have a chance to be able to get to your question and answer it in a later episode. Thanks a lot for listening. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye.